Hello, my name is Corbin, and today I'll be showing you GC Mass Spec. That stands for Gas Chromatography Mass Spectroscopy. Today, the things I'll be covering is how to prepare a sample to run through the GC Mass Spec. I will show you how to inject a sample, we'll run it through, and then we'll, we'll set up how to start the GC Mass Spec, and I'll show you the program to do that. The final thing will be to analyze your data, because that's the most important thing. You want to know what is the sample that I've just prepared. We'll finish off with interpreting the data that you've just acquired from the GC Mass Spec. The first thing is what is, what is GC Mass Spec and why is it important? In a nutshell, these are two different instruments that have been combined together to give more in-depth detail and analysis. The GC, or the gas chromatography aspect, is this part of the instrument. And what it composes of, there is a column in here that is very, very thin. And this, this is in millimeters. And so you can see it's very thin, and when it's stretched out, is about 30 meters long. And what this does is this chamber is heated, and you, when you inject a sample, the sample runs through this entire coil, and what it does is it separates your samples based on boiling points. And every sample has a unique boiling point in, in which that it'll separate through here. And when it's done going through there, it will, the samples will have been separated into individual components of whatever your unknown is. That's the GC part of it. The mass spec then takes those samples and it splits it into ions. And, and each sample and each element fragments and separates a little bit differently. And so when you put the two together, you get a really good idea of what your unknown is. Now the mass spec part of the machine is right here. And it gets shot with a couple different things. It could be, could be again, with temperature and try to break down the chemicals in there. Another aspect would be to hit it with radiation, in which case you cleave and fragment different parts of your, of your compound that you're looking at. The GC mass spec also, because of the temperature and the speed at which it's going, there's also a vacuum, which is controlled by this. And that part's not so important in the actual running of how things work, but it, it's, it's an important for the machine to actually function the way it's supposed to. So what I will do is I will make a sample, and I will show you how to run a sample through the GC mass spec. So the first thing I will do is prepare my sample. As I am working with chemicals, I have gloves on to protect myself, and I will also put on my safety goggles. These are necessary whenever you are working with chemicals for your own protection. So the first thing I have is I have a couple solvents here. And I have my samples. So I'm going to pick one of these samples. And the sample that I picked is concentrated. So I will have to dilute it. The reason for that being the GC part of it, the gas chromatography, it runs the sample through the column and it tries to separate out the components of your sample. When you have too much sample and it's too concentrated, the GC has a hard time uh, separating it and you don't get very good results. So I have a couple I have a couple commonly used solvents here. This one is hexane. It's a pretty, pretty general one. There's methanol. 
This, this is probably the universal one, that and acetone, which is the one I will be using today. Now, if you know what your sample is, you're going to want to make sure that the solvent you use is compatible with your sample. If you don't know, methanol and acetone are pretty universal, so you're going to have to use one of those and you're going to have to see. I know acetone works with my sample, so that's what I'm going to be using today. Now the sample itself goes into one of these little tubes. And these little tubes have a max capacity of one and a half milliliters. So when I do my dilution, I have one of two, thing, two, one of two ways I can do that. The first way would be to dilute my sample directly in this vial. And the, the only problem with that is if, you're trying to di if you have a super concentrated sample, you might not be able to dilute it enough in this, in this vial. And the way to get around that would be to have a beaker and you would dilute your sample in the beaker and then transfer some of that liquid into this vial. One of the benefits of GC mass spec is the amount of sample that you need to run. Just because this vial is one and a half mils does not mean that you necessarily need all that. You could probably get away with using just under a mil and that would still work. And there, there are some benefits to this. The first is that if you don't have a lot of sample, and in an organic, sometimes your yield, you only have, a, have about a 10% actual yield. And so you don't have very much sample. And so this helps because you can still analyze your compound even with that little bit of sample. The second benefit of this is that you don't need to exhaust your sample just to analyze it. So this sample, when I analyze it, I won't be able to use to run different tests on. But because I only need a little bit of it, I can aliquot some of it to run on the instrument. And the rest of it I can save to do other experiments and other tests with. And I can, I can go from there. So the first thing I will do is I will add a little bit of my sample to this vial. Today, we are doing qualitative um, GC mass spec. We're trying to figure out what is my sample, not how much of my sample is there. The GC mass spec can do quantitative and qualitative analysis, but if you, if you want precise data, we, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to realize how much, what the concentration of your sample is and what dilution factor you're using. So, because we're just ch trying to figure out what, I'll just add a little bit of my sample in there. Now, the, this sample is a, is a concentrated stock dilution, uh, uh, aliquot of our sample. And if you noticed, I had a little bit of sample still left in my pipette tip. I had to put it into my waste beaker because I did not want to contaminate my stock sample. Just keep that in mind whenever you're using your sample that you, you do not want to contaminate it. So that was the reason I, d I did not pour my excess back into my sample. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of our solvent and fill it up to about the one and a half milliliter mark. Now one thing that we have to realize is we have just added acetone to our sample. So when we run it through the GC mass spec, it will pick up the fact that we have a lot of acetone in there. 
And that's not a big deal. We, we will correct that, and I'll show you how to correct that on the instrument using a solvent delay. But that's just something to keep in mind, that your sample now has acetone in it. Now the next thing I'm going to do is, is put a cap on it. These caps are a little special, as they have a little part in the center that allows for a syringe to be able to uh, go through there while still having the cap on. This helps in multiple ways, as you don't have a chance of spilling your sample and losing it, as there's a cap on there. Second is if you are, have something that is potentially dangerous, and the fumes could be dangerous, you want to make sure that it's closed, and that helps as well, especially if you have volatile solutions. So now what I'm going to do is, now that I've had my sample made, I will show you how to inject the sample into the GCMS spec. And once we've done that, I will show you how to analyze the data, and the last thing will be to interpret the data that you've had. And we will figure out what our unknown is. To inject a sample in our GC mass spec, there are a couple of ways we can do this. The method we'll be using today is manual injection. Manual injection just means that I personally will inject the sample into the machine. And this is, this is the, the, one I'll, the syringe I'll be using today. Now the first thing I want to do is make sure that my syringe works. That it actually draws up liquid, so that'll be the first thing. And then secondly, that it's been properly washed. And so the first thing is I have a little bit of acetone here. As my solvent was acetone, I should rinse my syringe with acetone. So I'm, I'm just going to stick it in some acetone and push the plunger up a couple times just to rinse it. And then I will draw a little bit up and just push it out and make sure that some of my sample actually comes out. And it did. So we're good. And now that my syringe has been rinsed, I can add some of my sample to the instrument. And all I do is I poke it through there. The syringe is now in there. And I draw up about one, just one microliter is enough. So I draw it out, and the first thing I want to make sure is are there any air bubbles? And if so, then I will have to pump a couple times to try to get rid of those air bubbles. And it's, it's standard just to pump anyways, even if you don't, just to make sure that you've, you're now rinsing the syringe with your sample. So I've done that a couple times. And I'll draw some up, and then I'll pull it out. And now, to actually inject into the juicy mess spec, I will place the needle there, just to make sure, and I will grab it about halfway up, and I will push down using both hands. And now what this does is the needle is long and, and, and fragile. So by giving it support, I will make sure that I don't break the needle and that it goes in straight up and down. Otherwise, I will not have gotten my sample into the machine where it's supposed to be. Now, all I simply need to do is press down and take out. Now, there, that was the manual injection. There is also an auto sample uh, sampler that you can attach onto these equipments. And the reason I used manual injection today was because I just have one sample and I'm just going to run it really quickly. The benefit of having an auto sampler is if you have many samples that you're trying to run through a day. And so what you can do is you can load all your vials into the auto sampler and you can set up a program 
and it'll just keep running your samples through. And so you theoretically could set it up in the morning, go and do some other thing, and then come back in the evening and all your samples will have been run and analyzed. The auto sampler that we have is right here. And now the auto sampler sits in here like so. And what it does is it has all these little rows that you can stick a bunch of vials through. And so they're each numbered. And so I can have up to 16 samples that I can run. And I just set up a program and it runs through it. And it'll inject it for me using the syringe. And, and then we'll be on our way. Now, the auto sampler, if you use it a lot, the, there is the possibility that the syringe can break as it is not as gentle and does not provide the support for the needle that we do when we have the manual injection. So if you don't need to use the auto sampler, it's best for the instrument to just do manual injections. The next thing we'll have to do is run our sample through the GCMS spec and then analyze the data and then interpret it. In order to run a sample through the GC mass spec, I have to do one of two things. Either I can create a new method or I can run an existing one. Today I'll show you how to create your own method. So I'll click on the sweet baby icon and that is how to run this instrument. And a screen like this will pop up. And so to create a method, you have to click on the method icons and say edit entire method. And then hit the OK button on the next screen that's prompted. And then you'll give your method a name. So I'll just name this trial run. This is, this is just for trial basis. And then I'll hit OK. And then the next the next little pop-up box, you can just say OK to that. It's not that important. The most important box is going to be this one. And what this allows you to do is select your oven temperatures. So this is important because you want to make sure that the oven is hot enough that the sample you have can reach its boiling point and get into the gas phase. If it's too cool, your sample will never get into the gas phase and you, and you, won't, be able to, you won't be able to analyze your data. And so there's a couple limits on this. The oven temperature should not exceed 250 degrees Celsius for the, for the health of the instrument itself. And for this, I'm, I'm going to just leave it at 85 degrees Celsius. That's fine. And now what this screen also lets you do is set up runs. And what a run is, or a ramp, is also what it's called, is it allows you to change the temperature to, to different things and you can hold it for, for different time lengths. And what this allows you to do is if you have multiple samples or multiple compounds in your sample or elements, you can separate those out by running, by running different ramps. So you can start at maybe 50 degrees and hold that for five minutes and everything that boils at that point and goes into the gas phase at that point will have run through the column and then you ramp it up to 100 and 150. And this just allows you to better separate what your sample is. So I'll, I'll leave it at 85. And there's, there's, there's other things. This is for the auto sampler. And what this allows you to do is select how many washes and how many pumps the syringe will do in the auto sampler. Right now it has about two it has two washes for each for each post and pre-injection. And this just helps with with the uh, with the syringe and it also has sample pumps. And the reason for the pumps are to, as I mentioned earlier with the manual, is to get rid of those air bubbles and to make sure that your sample is actually injected. 
And so for this, since I did a manual injection, I don't really have to worry about. The inlets, this is all set up. The column is just based on what I showed you before. And so there's really not much else that you need to, that you need to really worry about. So after you've set the temperature and any ramps that you're going to do, you can just hit the OK button. And then you'll be prompted by the next screen, in which you can just say, hit OK, and for the next one as well. And then now you'll see a screen that says MS, SIM, and the scan parameters. The first thing you're going to do is look at your solvent delay. And what the solvent delay does is it helps for the instrument to tell, so that way when you're looking at your graph, you don't get the solvent in there. And if most solvents will usually, they will boil at a lower temperature than the actual sample. And so what you can do is you can delay when the instrument starts reading till after the solvent has already passed through the column. And so right now I have the solvent delay at a, at a minute. And th this is pretty typical, and this is fine. And so you can, you can leave that. And then there's a, there's a button that says scan parameters. And the scan parameters has to do with the mass spec part of the instrument. And what that does is, as I stated earlier, it breaks up the, the parts of your, their sample and it ionizes them. And so there are different fragments that, that, that your sample gets cut into. And those are based on a charge to mass ratio. What you can tell, what this screen does is tell you what mass do you want it to pick up. And you can set the thresholds of the masses. So if I'm working with acetone and I know what the atomic mass is, I could put that as my threshold if my sample were above it. And what this does is just helps clean up the things. And the most important thing is you don't want to set the threshold too low is because the carrier gas in this GC mass spec is helium. So the lowest mass you can go is, is about five. But 35, you, you know, you don't need to go much below 35. Unless you have a really small sample, say something like potentially methanol. In which case the atomic the atomic mass is below 35, so you need to lower it then. But for our samples, we can just leave it at 35 to 250. This gives us a really broad range, and we don't, we don't need to really mess with that. And the, the helium won't be detected, so we won't have to worry about that showing up in our analysis. So then we'll just hit OK. And the next thing is select the type of report that you want. And the reports that we're going to want is the, probably the percent report. The library search report is, is for if you are trying to identify an unknown that's not very common and what it'll try to do is it'll try to take the mass spectra that you get and compare it to other known libraries. The quantitative report is for if you were, if you were doing a quantitative run through, which we're just doing qualitative so we don't need that. The custom report is basically kind of a, a mixture of all of these and we don't need to worry about it. So just continue with the percent report and hit OK. And then it'll, it has two ways that the percent report will be sorted by. The first is signal and the second is retention time. The retention time means how long does that part of the sample stay in the column. Now the column itself is made up of a mobile phase and a stationary phase and different different compounds and elements will stick and adhere to either the motion the mobile phase or the stationary phase for different periods of times and so the retention time just means how long did my my that part of my sample stay in stay in the column the signal was how how um, the kind of the intensity of the of the sample that went through so we'll just keep it at that and then you have either show the, res the report on the screen or the printer 
If you don't need your printed, if you don't need the report printed out, uncheck this box as you, you're printing paper that you don't really need. The screen one is fine for what we're doing. So hit the OK button. And then what you will do is you'll give your method a name. And so I could, I could name this our trial run. And so now whenever you try to use this method again, that'll be the name that it's under. So try to make a, a detailed name so you know exactly what the run is meant for. So then hit OK and now you've just created your method. And so when, whatever you want to do is you just say load your method and then you can just click on it and hit OK and now it's in there and whenever you need to run a sample you can just load that method and you don't have to set up a new one again. So now that I've created a method, the first thing I have to do is I have to now run it through there. And so the first thing is what do I want my sample to be known as? And so I'll have to go into the line under data file name and I will have to say whatever I want. For this I'm just going to keep it at trial run number one. But this is an important box because this lets you know what your sample is. So important information you're going to want to include is your name, your, potentially your lab or your class that you're taking, and the general idea for, for what sample you're running through. Is it a Grignard? Is it a sterification? Those kind of things. Or, or is it just, you know, an unknown sample? And then you, if it's an unknown, you're going to want to state the number or the letter of the unknown. The sample name is if you have multiple samples that you're running under the same thing. So if I have, you know, and if I say it's just an esterification reaction, if I want to do it, I can say ester 1 or ester 2 or alcohol 1 or alcohol 2. But that's not as important. The major thing is the file name because that'll, that's what you will then go under to check your results later. Now, because we did a manual run, that's the only thing we need to worry about. If we had done an auto sampler, we would have had to worry about vial numbers and where it's at. But we don't have to worry about that. So all we have to do is hit OK and run method. The next thing that'll pop up is you'll see this. The bar has, is turned yellow, and it'll say pre-run. And what this means is it will start to, you just want to click. The box popped up and said, do you want to continue to run? Just say hit run. And then you'll see a box that pops up saying acquisition and it wants to know if you want to override the solvent delay. And what you'll do is you'll just say no. Because if you override the solvent delay, it'll, it'll, it's bad for the instrument, and by not overriding it, the instrument will be more healthy and it'll have a longer life. And the way to know is if your run is successful, is you'll see the bar has now turned blue, and you'll see a you'll see the numbers counting up on how long your runtime is. That means that your, your injection was successful and that the instrument is, is uh, acquiring the data. Another way to check would to be look at the instrument itself and there's a little screen and that just confirms the results, or that confirms that your run and what your settings are as the screen. It'll tell you the oven temperature and things like that. And that's just the second way to confirm that your, your injection was successful. So the instrument is now running the sample. And after this run is done, my run is five minutes. You, you can determine run length in the, in the screen showed above, or showed earlier. And once the run is done, I will then show you how to analyze the data. It's important to analyze our data. So what we're going to do is there's an icon called Sweet Baby Data Analysis, and we're going to open that. And so you should see a new screen come up. Now the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to find your sample. So you're going to hit the Browse button. And then you're going to have to find it. And so there's a couple cascading effects that you need to do. Is you need to click on the C, and then you're going to qu click on MSD chem, the folder, and then you're going to hit the folder, open the folder, 
labeled one. And then you're gonna open the data folder under that. You're gonna have to scroll over. And you're gonna open up the sweet baby test folder. And this is where all your samples are gonna be. Now there's a lot of samples that have already been run in here. And so this is where the importance of naming your sample comes in place. Because otherwise you'd never be able to find it. So I labeled ours just trial run number one. So I find my folder and I open up that folder and then this should pop up. And now what this is, is this is the gas chromatogram of the sample that you just ran. And so what this means is this is the signal going through the column with your sample is run. So in your sample it detected with reasonable certainty we can say three things. And because we did the solvent delay this first peak is going to be the prominent thing in our sample and what our sample is. These other peaks could be impurities and uh, those because we're just doing qualitative this those peaks aren't as important. Now had we not done the solvent delay about right here there'd be a massive peak and that would be in this case acetone for our solvent. But because we did the solvent de delay we eliminated that peak and the biggest peak is going to be our sample. And so now what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to get the mass spectra of that. And so we're going to double right click on this part of the on this peak and below it you'll get a mass spectra of this this compound. And so what this is is the the fragmentation pattern of that compound. The mass spectra is unique to its compounder elements. From this what we can see is probably the 73 is the the kind of the parent mass. This is the mass of the entire molecule. And now what this, so when it goes through the mass spectrum, different parts of the, different parts of the compound get broken off and ionized. And so what most likely happened here is this was a loss of about 12 or 13. So we most likely lost, that's probably a, if it's 13, it's either nitrogen or it could be a carbon or, you know, some, something like that. So that's what that means. So from that, we can tell there, there's probably a, maybe a carbon or a hydrogen or a nitrogen in here somewhere. And then from these little peaks, we can see that there are other fragmentation patterns by losing certain elements from that compound. And this is really what will tell you what your, what your compound is. And from this, you, you can determine what your unknown is. Now, this unknown happens to be propanoic acid from this spectrum. I can determine that. So what we were able to do is take an unknown sample that we didn't have any idea what it was. We diluted it, and we ran it through the GCMS spec. We created a method. We ran it through, and we analyzed it. And now we're able to interpret this data and figure out what is our unknown. From this part of it, we can see that this is not necessarily the purest sample, but we can at least get an idea of what it is. There are some other samples in here that are, that are pure, and I can, I can show you what that looks like, so you kind of get an idea of how it works on determining the purity of a sample. For example, this is a, the gas chromatogram of a previous sample. And what you can see is there's one big tall peak. From this information you can see that this sample was pretty pure. There were hardly any impurities in it. And so this, this is a way that the GC can be used in, the, in determining the purity of a sample. And then again here is the here is the spectra of this sample.
And so this just lets us know what this sample is and to make sure that it is what we think it is. So now that you know what a pure sample looks like, this is an example of a sample that has lots of impurities in it. And if you get a spectrum that, or a gas chromatograph that looks like this, there's a couple things that you need to do. One, it means that you probably didn't isolate your, the substance that you were really wanting. Or two, you introduced some foreign impurity and you need to start over either way. Because from this information, you can't tell anything. All the, all the peaks overlap and you can't determine where one peak starts, where one peak ends. And there's a ton of impurities in it. So I pulled up the trial run that we just did again to show another useful feature of the GC mass spec. If you have an unknown sample, what the, because this is all based on, uh, this is a computer, you can compare it to a database like the NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technologies. And so what I can do is I can pull up the spectra of any peak that I want. And that's done by, again, double right clicking on that peak. And now what I can do is if I double right click on the spectra, it'll show me what the closest match to that spectra is. And it'll show me what the NIST spectra is to what my sample spectra is supposed to be. Now this is a useful tool because sometimes it is, it's hard to tell what a sample is and you don't want to have to spend the work to try to determine the spectra if you can just look it up and see what it is using the NIST standards. So I can do that for this peak and I find that this peak is propanoic acid. If I do it for this, I see that this one, this peak, is there was some, there was cyclohexanol in my sample. And so this is just a really useful tool. It compares the, the spectra that it's the, that's in the library to what yours is. And it's just another useful tool for identifying unknowns in your sample. The next thing is to go to the shutdown process for the computer. The first thing is to exit out of the data analysis uh, box. This is just because it's no longer necessary box. And so you'll just say, you hit the exit, the changes have already been saved, so you can just hit yes. So now, the important thing here is, and this is a step that you never want to forget, because you could ruin the instrument if you, if you forget this. This is a crucial step. Under methods for the data now, for the, for the running of your sample, you're going to hit method and you're going to go to load method. This is where you would normally find your method if you wanted to run, you know, a sample through. Under there, you'll find a method known as standby. You're going to want to click that and then hit OK. Now what this does is this has certain settings that allow the GC mass spec to go into its kind of sleep mode. You never want to shut it off because that will affect the oven and the column and, and it's just not good for the instrument. But you also don't want to leave it on, on uh, uh, high temperature. And so this standby is, is an important part in helping the GC mass spec to be a better running and, and a longer living machine. And so it's a, it's a step that you never ever want to forget. Once you've done that, you can exit out of this screen as well. And now you've just learned how to run a sample through a GC mass spec. After first making the sample and making a method, you've seen the inner components on how a GC mass spec works with the column and the, the gas chromatography part of it and the mass spectroscopy and how those two are fused together to, to create this instrument that can detect unknowns. We've learned some uses for the GCMS spec in determining purity, determining unknowns, and how it's used outside of the academics in forensics and pharmacy and also in, uh, in the NASA program for the Mars rover. We've run our instrument through, we found out our unknown was propanoic acid, and now we've shut it down, and that 
is how to use a GCMS bag.